really matters? That might be the most important question you can ask. So let's talk about it. Welcome to What Really Matters podcast, Everyday Spirituality with Karen Wyatt. Thank you for joining me here today. This is the 10th episode in a series I'm doing on a grief trip I took through Italy. It was a plan to be a second honeymoon in Italy, but it ended up being upturned and disrupted by a grief experience that happened at the beginning of the trip. And you can go back all the way back 10 episodes ago and listen to the full story. I encourage you to because um, a lot has already taken place on this trip and we're now uh, near the very end. Actually, this was what I'm talking about today is the last stop of our trip and the final novena that I performed during this trip. So after this episode, there will just be one more, which will be kind of a conclusion and, and summary. Um, but today we're talking about the ninth novena and the story of that part of our trip, which took place in the beautiful coastal town of Sorrento. And Sorrento's just north of the Amalfi Coast, which is incredible. All of it is incredible. This, uh, all the towns along this bay of the Mediterranean, I think it's the Bay of Naples, but a fabulously beautiful area and it was really a wonderful place to end our trip through Italy to be back on the coastline once again and I described in the last episode that I had a somewhat frustrating trip to Assisi and I realized it's because I, I had been so excited about Assisi and had placed a lot of weight on my visit there and the novena that would happen there. And I really expected Assisi to be a miraculous breakthrough in some way of my grief. I expected to find healing there and a lot of insight. And in fact, Assisi was a huge letdown to me. And as I, you can go back and listen to that episode if you haven't heard it already. But as I said, partly because we arrived there on a major festival day for St. Francis and the entire city was just thronged with pilgrims who had traveled from all over the world to be there. So we really were not able to do some of the things I had hoped to do. And there was not a feeling of meditation and contemplation and serenity that I had wanted and expected there. So I had some disappointment. And then it was time to travel to Sorrento. And on this travel day, we had to take a train to Rome and another train from Rome to Naples. And then we had to to get on a small commuter train called the Circum Vesuviana in order to get to Sorrento. And that, that train was actually very slow and took a long time. So basically, we traveled throughout the day and we didn't arrive at our hotel in Sorrento until 5 p.m. And it turns out our hotel was actually south of the city. So we arrived by train. We had to take a bus from the train station and then we had to walk uphill dragging our suitcases for another mile or so to get to this cliffside location of our hotel. And we were feeling a little frustrated that our hotel was outside of town, which I hadn't quite understood the significance of that when I made the reservation. And we were very tired, very hungry, and passing by lots of other hotels where we really wished we were staying. But we dragged our suitcases up the hill. Uh, We entered into the entrance for the hotel, which turned out to be just an elevator that we had to take up to the fifth floor in order to get to the reception for our hotel. So again, we're feeling like, where are we staying? What have we done? You know, this, this is exhausting. Why are we here? But we got to the reception area and the lobby of our hotel, which connects to a vast patio 
on the top of a cliff with the most stunning view of the Mediterranean Sea and across the bay to Naples. And it was filled with flowers and so lovely. And there was such a nice breeze blowing and beautiful music playing. And it was like we had walked into an oasis. And so uh, at that moment, everything shifted for that entire day. We were so happy to be there and so thrilled. And we had a lovely room with lots of windows overlooking the water. And it was really a welcome refuge for us. Uh, This really was a place where there was some solitude and serenity and a very relaxed vibe. That night, we ate dinner at the hotel at the restaurant, which is on the terrace overlooking the water. We sat right by the railing. We had this private little table. There was amazing lighting around the terrace that was very lovely and very beautiful. Again, flowers everywhere. So our table overlooked the water and across the bay, we could see the lights of Naples and the silhouette of Mount Vesuvius against the night sky. It was so stunning. It was incredible. And we had a very romantic dinner. And I realized like this was going to be our second honeymoon this entire trip. And here it was for the first time. We had this amazing romantic setting. We'd been through a lot on our trip already, as you may have heard if you've listened to the other episodes. And at last, we were in a place together where we were able to finally celebrate our relationship and our being together in the way that we had wanted to set our hoped and planned to celebrate for the entire trip. So finally, we had our romantic evening. It was really beautiful and really wonderful. And what a very special way to to close out our vacation with this, our, our final stay in Sorrento. So that was the first night after a long, long day of travel. The next day, we got up and walked into the town of Sorrento itself. And this was the day that I was planning to do the ninth novena. So we did a walking tour of the city. And it's a, it's a small, lovely city filled with lemons because this area is famous for growing lemon trees. So there were just lemons everywhere, the scent of lemons, but all the markets sold fresh lemons, but also pottery, uh, linens, everything designed with lemons. So everywhere you go, you see lemons. And it was really lovely and bright and fun and cheery to walk through Sorrento. On our travels through, we visited a couple of churches, and and I had decided initially to do all of my novenas at churches because that kind of made sense to me. It was a place where I would be able to light a candle and have a little ritual moment of silence and contemplation. And we visited, too, the sanctuary of the Madonna del Carmine, and which is famous for having a copy of a painting of the brown Madonna, which I'd never heard of before, but it was a Madonna whose face was painted with a brownish color paint. Um, So, but uh, that sanctuary just didn't do much for me. And we next visited the Sorrento Cathedral. And Likewise, you know, I, I guess for I had taken for granted with my previous novenas that there would always be something breathtaking or inspiring or amazing that would lead me to know this is the place. This is where I do my novena. This is where I say the prayer. And I just didn't feel it that day. I didn't feel it anywhere. And yet it was my last opportunity to finish out the novena. So once again, I felt disappointed. And um, it seemed like my whole novena practice was kind of falling flat. Um, I didn't get to have what I wanted in a CC on that original visit, though I made up for that a few years later when we went back again. And here in Sorrento, I just, I just didn't get a clear feeling 
that there was a right place for me to do the novena, but I did it anyway in the Cathedral of Sorrento and said my novena prayer, lit a candle, and um, and that was that. Although, I, again, I was disappointed it was my last novena prayer, and I so wanted it to feel really special and really moving to me, and it didn't. So again, I had disappointment and and all of this, the disappointment comes always because we have expectations. That's what happened in Assisi. I had expectations I was attached to. And when they didn't, were not realized, they didn't manifest for me in Assisi, I was disappointed. And likewise here in Sorrento, I wanted to feel something more. We're in this beautiful place. It's so, it's so lovely here. I wanted to feel more moved and to feel a, a deeper and profound wisdom here or insight, but it wasn't there for me that morning as we walked around Sorrento. But for the afternoon, our plans were to visit Pompeii, which was a place I had also been really excited to see, having learned about it in history class long ago and been intrigued about the city of Pompeii that was destroyed during the eruption of Mount Vesuvius. And so our afternoon that day was spent traveling to Pompeii, which we had to get back on the Circumvesuviana slow train to get to Pompeii. But it was absolutely incredible. We were reminded of some of the history of Pompeii. And so the eruption of Vesuvius happened on August 24th in AD 79. And the reason we know so much about it is because a 17-year-old young man, Pliny the Younger, witnessed it along with his uncle Pliny the Elder. They witnessed it from across the bay. And his uncle Pliny the Elder, who was a Roman fleet commander, took a boat across the bay to try to help in a rescue and ended up dying there. And um, eyewitnesses to his uncle's death came back and told Pliny the Younger the story of how his, his uncle had died. He'd been overcome and asphyxiated by inhaling fumes from the volcano. But Pliny the Younger wrote about the eruption of the volcano and everything that had been witnessed at that time. And that's why we have this amazing historical record of what actually happened. And so we know Vesuvius erupted and covered the city, um, some say under 30 feet of ash and um, pyroclastic flow, they call it. And uh, it was not rediscovered. So the city was completely buried and it was not rediscovered until the year 1599, almost 1500 years after this incident that the city was discovered. And then excavation started in 1748. So about 150 years later, uh, they were able to start excavating Pompeii. So it's really fascinating to think of this natural disaster that occurred now almost 2,000 years ago um, that we have a historical record of that wasn't discovered in the physical realm for 1,500 years, and it's still there for us to observe and witness what the state of Pompeii, the city of Pompeii, and what it looked like at the time of this devastation by the lava flow from Vesuvius. So uh, it was uh, really remarkable. And I, I want to just read to you what I wrote in my journal, because it says it a little better than I can tell you right now. We had an amazing experience touring Pompeii. We spent about four hours looking at the ruins, blown away by the excavation they've done there. You can totally get a sense of the daily life of the Romans, seeing the small cafes where they would buy food and drink, the small dwellings of the poorer residents, and the enormous lavish homes of the rich. The floor mosaics were beautiful, as were the frescoes on the walls. The streets were a mixture of shops and cafes, small homes, palaces, bathhouses, brothels, and temples. 
You could easily imagine living there. The more lavish homes had gardens inside with beautiful sculptures and fountains, very pleasing and serene. The most moving part of the Pompeii experience was seeing the plaster casts form of formed of some of the bodies of the victims. And, and so I'll interrupt here. Um, during excavations in more modern times, the archaeologists who were working there found certain areas where there was less density in this um, petrified ash they were walking on. And so they injected the holes with pl um, plaster in order to see what what might have caused these holes when they then excavated down to the plaster casts that remained, they found that they were all human bodies. And so humans had died and their bodies had deteriorated and decayed, leaving spaces in the, in the petrified ash in the shape of a human body. So when they injected it with plaster, these casts were formed of the people who were, who had been killed by Vesuvius. Um, I, I go on to write, they all died most likely of suffocation from the ash and rock that poured down on them. One display was called the Garden of the Refugees. These were bodies that were found in one building attempting to shield themselves from the downpour. One body was clearly a woman lying on her side and looking down at a child next to her, curling his body toward her. I was overcome with emotion to imagine the fear and helplessness they must have felt, especially the mother wanting to protect her child. It was very powerful. And so... Uh, this profound emotion that I wanted to feel in the church in Sorrento is actually what happened in Pompeii at the Garden of the Refugees when I, I looked upon the plaster cast of this mother and a child lying next to her and imagining this moment, um, a mother wishing that she could shield her child, wishing that she could do anything to protect her child from what was coming, and wishing that death would not happen, and yet it inevitably was coming for them and would happen. And um, here was my novena in Pompeii at the Garden of the Refugees, and I, I didn't expect it. I wasn't prepared for it at all. Um, it made me very tearful and I feel tearful right now just thinking about it because it brought up all of this angst that I had felt, all the pain I had felt for the mother of my patient and the pain that she was going through um, to have her son die and not be able to help him and not be able to protect him. And so here on my last day of novenas was kind of the culminating moment as I sat there viewing a mother and her child who died nearly 2,000 years ago in a natural disaster that no one could prevent, that no one could change, no one could fix, no one could do anything about it. It was simply life unfolding the way it does and there was so much pain in those sculptures for me, for me personally in that moment that all rushed to the surface at once, but also this wise revelation that we cannot prevent death from happening. We simply can't prevent the fact that we're mortal and that we will all die. And yes, there are times when we can forestall death and we can bring someone back from the brink of of death only to know that they will die later eventually of something else but that ultimately we we cannot change the fact that that we're mortal and that everyone will die and it has always been that way everywhere around the world and always will be that way. It's even that way in our universe, as I've said before, because 
Stars die. Planets die. Suns die. Galaxies can die. And so as we, as we take all of this in and this, as I said, this like capping moment of this travel through Italy to be in this place where, where I was actually traveling back in time 2,000 years earlier, feeling the pain and fear and the helplessness of death. It brought me back to the place of recognizing that to continue to carry guilt because another person died would not serve me well in my life. That at some point I had to surrender to the fact that death comes and we can't control when it comes and it's it's not our fault or our responsibility. We simply have to carry it and accept the pain that is there. And so on that final novena, and I, I really consider this moment in the Garden of the Refugees in Pompeii, this was my last novena. This prayer that went up from that from that place, witnessing this mother and child for all of the losses everywhere throughout time for all of humanity, for all of the pain of having to allow someone we love to be mortal and having to accept that they are mortal and that they will die. So much pain in surrendering to that, so much pain in saying goodbye. And yet it's what life is and it's what life offers us and it's it's the grist for the mill it is what we have to utilize for our growth for our wisdom for our knowledge and that's the moment when I think truly I began to stop blaming myself for my father's death and for my patient's death when I began to feel the light of forgiveness, self-forgiveness, beginning to glimmer within me. And so my novena was completed, but in fact, the healing that would take place had just begun. And I didn't know that either. I thought the novena was complete unto itself, but oh my goodness, there was so much more, so much more in the months and the years that followed that novena experience um, that helped me continue to go deeper, continue to learn more about grief and guilt. So the novena was really the beginning of all of it. And in the next episode, I'll talk a little bit more about some of the insights that I've had since that time and also uh, an experience or two that happened on a later trip to Italy. So again, I hope you'll go back and listen to all the previous episodes about this Italy trip if you want to get the full picture of, of what was happening, since I can't give you a complete summary of everything. And if you've listened this far and been listening to this series, I just want to thank you. I appreciate you. I am getting ready to write a book with all of these stories in it, plus many more from that particular trip. And being able to record them here as part of the podcast has really helped me to organize my thoughts and to get ready for this writing journey, which is actually has, it's, has really been um, a scary project for me to work on uh, because of needing to be so vulnerable uh, about some of the really deep shadow issues that I carry. So um, thank you if you've been listening. I really appreciate that. So I'll be back next week with the final episode in the Grief Travel to Italy series. And I hope you'll tune in then as well. And also make sure you subscribe wherever you're listening and leave a rating and review and share this with other people if you think it will be helpful to them. So until the next time we're together, remember that we're here for love. And I'm learning that we're also here for grief because it's part of love. So face your fear, be ready for whatever life brings you next. 
and love each and every moment of your very precious existence. Bye-bye. Thank you.